Hi, it me, Globo. I know we've all come to expect a bombastic beginning to these videos, but I don't want to undercut the main point. The Lord of the Tides is quite simply the best episode of Game of Thrones released in like eight years. To find something I'm reasonably confident is better than this episode, you'd have to go back to the Obama administration. That's like 18 prime ministers ago. So why is it so good? Well, we'll get to that! We have more important things to talk about first though, like the credits and what has changed. It's been six years since the last episode and there are a few teeny tiny little updates to the show's world, like how Rhaenyra and Daemon are now married and have two babies, the confusingly named Aegon and Viserys, and how Aemond has grown a stylish eye patch, and how King Viserys is still fine, it's okay, he's just sleeping! But interestingly, the credits are actually exactly the same as Episode 7's, except all the weird non-Valyrian names that keep popping up on screen are different now. Hannah? Pam? Surely you mean Hanera and Pam Eris. Oh, and they still haven't fixed the theme tune. Ah, uh, here's something thematically resonant I had lying around. And if your head explodes with dark forebodings too, I'll see you on the dark side of the moon. This episode is framed around and named after a succession crisis, but not that one, the other one. So the very first lines of dialogue establish the premise. Six years have passed, Corlys Valarian is dying of one too many cool adventures, and factionalism is quick to take root. Vaymond pushes his own claim to Driftmark. I am the sea snake's own blood, the closest kin he has left. As Corlys' stated heir, Rhaenyra's son Luke, is very obviously a bastardo. But bringing this up is actual treason. No, really, I mean it this time, you guys. Anyone whose tongue dares to question the birth of Princess Rhaenyra's sons should have it removed. So Rhaenys is careful not to indulge in this. She's been ruling Driftmark in Corlys' name for six years now. My grandmother seems quite comfortable here. And Vaymond conveniently overlooks Corlys' other heirs, Bela and Rhaena. If Vaymond were genuinely only concerned with Valarian blood, my brother cares only for the history books. <laughs> But what of the Valarian line? Then surely Corley's direct descendants through his daughter would suffice. The subtext is clear. The elephant is well and truly in the room. Vaiman's claim only holds true if one passes over female successes, as was the case when Viserys succeeded Joe all those years ago. He's telling Rhaenys that his claim comes before her daughters. So not only is Vaiman foregoing female succession, he's also defying the wishes of the current ruler, Corlys. It's just like Otto Hightower's ploy to forego the daughter that Viserys wishes to succeed him. The Driftmark succession then is sort of kinda almost a bit like the Iron Throne succession in microcosm, don't you know? By the way, Maester Kelvin says Corlys is at Evenfall Hall, which is the seat of Brienne's ancestors on Tarth, so that's something. Anyway, the whole thing is that even though King Viserys now employs a radical anti-treason policy regarding Rhaenyra, My cousin the king would have your tongue for this. Vaymond reckons he can assert his claim against her kids because Viserys no longer holds any power in King's Landing. But it's not a king who sits the Iron Throne these days, good sister. It's a queen. I sort of wish we cut to the Red Keep directly from here to see the Hightower influence there, because I'm a huge fan of these cute transitions where a character mentions a thing at a place and then we go there. It appeals to the monkeys in my brain. But we also need to set up the Rhaenyra side of this conflict, and it's a strong line to end on still. Instead, we cut to the Dragonmont, where Frank is hunting for eggs because there were none under the bridge. God damn, how much are they paying, Jawadi? Oh look, an extremely beautiful shot. We're about to enter the world of the dragon. So Cyrax has laid three X and the Eck Inspector is so excited about it. These eggs probably aren't Danny's eggs, by the way. The book indicates that her eggs were laid by Dreamfire a while back and by this point are already halfway around the world. But I reckon they could be the eggs of a few other dragons we know about, like Morning and Spoiler. The eggs are in this disgusting pile of hot dragon goop. Here we go. Dragon poo. And Damon's adorable eagerness and readiness to harvest them, I think kind of speaks to his passion for his Valyrian culture and all this dragon shit. Just like Viserys' passion for it, but his is less bookish and warhammery and more hands-on larpy. Look how fucking ecstatic he is to tell the dragon keepers about his big score. Harry Adroma. 
Haria Droma. Haria Droma? That's incredible! So I think the reason why I love this egg so much is a little bit complicated. But the fellas have news to give him from Baylor about Corlys and Veyman's plot to inherit the Driftwood throne. That the Dragon Keep is a trusted to deliver sensitive information to Prince Daemon says a lot about how they're trusted by the Dragonstone household. Speaking of the Dragonstone household, look at this dress! The brand new Jaceris Valarian Grown Up Edition is practicing his Valyrian at the painted table in an exceptionally believable display of a teenager learning a foreign language. Triumphantly declaring that Aegon ordered the trees be killed is so real. I killed my pencil. Broke? You broke your pencil? I broke him. He feels a sense of duty to carry on the Valyrian cultural legacy, like his grandfather Viserys, his gruncle Daemon, his stepdad Daemon, and his uncle Daemon. Valyria's weight may be even heavier on Jace's shoulders. He probably feels as though he has to work harder to uphold it to compensate for his quite visible non-Valyrian side. While Rhaenyra was fluent in her mother tongue at 14, <laughs> Jace is like 18 now and you can see that he struggles with the language not coming naturally to him. It's clear that he takes this shit seriously. King should honour the traditions of his forebears. And he knows he's a bastard and understands that makes his position unstable, so he works to present as legitimately as he can. He's basically a foil to Aegon in that sense. When Alicent tells Aegon, honey, stop wanking, it's time to be royal, you shit, his response is, fuck off, demon woman. But when Rhaenyra tells Jace, look kid, you're not going to be king for decades. Go outside, bully your brother, touch grass, you loser. His response is, but my Mom, I'm barely even a polyglot yet. So he's disappointed because he got some words confused. He calls the mouth of a river its end, which it basically is. And he says that trees got killed instead of felled, which for the tree means the same thing. You can see how conceptually these ideas get muddled in Jace's head, but what gets me is when Rhaenyra says, It is a related word. David Peterson's script says the word for felled in this tense is ropakaxon, but the maester says, Wesi misnaxion. Aegon undas. So I guess there was a change closer to airing. The canonical root for the verb to kill, you can skip this bit by the way. The canonical root for the verb to kill is asenagon. I need to stress that fucking nobody should care about the veracity of what Rhaenyra says here. It's essentially a throwaway line that excuses Jace getting that translation slightly wrong. The real meat of the line is that Aegon the Conqueror ordered certain trees to be destroyed and the term killed invokes the idea that the trees are more than just plants. Nobody says you kill a rosebush or a fucking broom shrub. So us crazy nerds are left thinking that maybe those trees were sentient weirwoods and what implications that might have. There are no structures in King's Landing said to be built from weirwood, as far as I remember. And Aegon was already aware of the White Walker threat, so maybe this is nothing, but it is interesting. So even with all that going on, in addition to the actual plot of the scene, enough attention was paid to these lines that David's original word in the translation got replaced with misnaxion, because it it sounds more like it descends from Asenagon. At least I think that's what happened. This is so, so minor to the point where I don't think I've seen anyone else talk about it and you're personally annoyed that I spent this much time talking about it, but as the one nerd simultaneously stupid enough to dig into this and smart enough to understand it, I can happily say that unlike some other shows I might name, House of the Dragon seems 100% committed to its fake languages, especially when characters are talking about the language. Misa means mother in Valerian. I know what Misa means. Uncle Daddy walks in and... Joffrey? Come. Okay, this has gone too far. Astute observers will notice that Rhaenyra is now pre jnat with her sixth child. Some have argued that her body isn't entirely reminiscent of someone who's performed five births, and to them I say Catelyn Stark. And, you know, Sirio was a bold king in the book, but they cast him as a dude with sick curls. Tyrion was supposed to be a noseless gremlin, but they cast the most handsome man on the planet and gave him a sexy scar. You know how it goes. No hairless Danny after the pyre, Lysa was described as thick, but Kate Dickey is like, not. Hell, Cersei gains weight in Feast and Game of Thrones didn't do that. It's weird how the only fat characters from the books who stayed fat in the show are men. Oh, and Fat Walder. Gilly's allowed to gain weight when she's pregnant as well. Now, the 
book goes out of its way a few times to mention how fat Rhaenyra becomes, not losing her baby weight and stress eating later on. The show still has plenty of time to do this in the future if they want to, but more importantly, that always came off to me as commentary on how a woman's perceived value and character are tied to how strictly she conforms to society's expectations of her, and is to contrast with Alicent, who the book states remained graceful and slender as she aged. Although, in a description to the artist Amok from 2006, George wrote that Rhaenyra was pudgy and stout, and made sure to mention that she had a very large bosom. Thanks, George. Great! HBO is obviously beholden to societal beauty standards in its casting choices. The average viewer would probably find the idea of fat people doing incest a lot less exciting, especially if they happen to already live in Tasmania. But at the same time, it's also influential in changing those standards. It's not my place to say whether it's a good thing they cast someone of Emma Darcy's stature as Rhaenyra. You could argue that it's an important part of the character in the book and therefore not something to be changed so lightly, and I wouldn't necessarily disagree with you, but I don't think it's a given. All I know is Emma Darcy's fucking cool, and I think they've done a great job. Rhaenyra and Damon talk about Vaemon's plan. If he can successfully claim Driftmark over Luke, then that's basically enshrining the illegitimacy of Rhaenyra's kids in law. While Vaemon doesn't care much about the Iron Throne succession, he certainly harbours no affection for Rhaenyra, and it's plain to see how he could easily ally with the Greens over this. Rhaenys is going to court in opposition to Vaemon, and her interests kinda align more with Rhaenyra's, but also... She believes we had her son killed so that we might marry. Didn't really think that one through, did you besties? She keeps Damon's daughter Baylor around though, so she can't hate them too much. <laughs> I mean, she's a granddaughter. Knowing that they can't well leave the situation in the hands of others, Rhaenyra says... What choice do I have? To King's Landing then. Steffi D announces Rhaenyra's arrival, and Alan Caswell shows up to give her that flaccid greeting I mentioned all those years ago. Presumably nobody else could come because they were busy attending a captivating seminar delivered by the Lord of the Hives. How hard can it be? The Red Keep's previously bustling halls are quiet and empty now, its bestial tapestries and red and black decor gone away with and traded out for symbols of the Seven. This is no longer a place that revels in the independently defined Valyrian-themed power of House Targaryen, but instead now celebrates the Westerosi institutions it once defied. Alicent sits at the head of the council table, where Viserys once sat. Lord B! Beesbury? How are you people not sick of that yet? Delivers a fascinating report on grass drying or something before Hazard tells everyone the people are here. The small council is not all on the same page regarding the thing. Orwile and Beeman are matter of fact about Corley's wishes to have Luke succeed him, but the rest seem to have a more not giving a shit take on what Corley says. Thailand, as my Google Doc keeps autocorrecting his name to, says Luke shouldn't inherit because he hasn't spent any time on Driftmark and he doesn't know how to say sailory things like way and anchor, or draw lines, or I'm fucking gay, or Soon may the weller man come to bring us sugar and tea and come. One day when the tongue is done we'll take our leave and go. But that really shouldn't have any bearing on whether or not he's fit to rule Driftmark, as Lyman says. Big Dick Jasper Wilde says Corley's never made any formal declaration making Luke his heir, and it's basically up to Otto Hightower to choose what happens. The crown must choose what is best for the realm. The Queen's got other shit to do, so she just says, yep, cool, we'll deal with it tomorrow, and off she goes. Eric Cargill, get hype, tells her that Aegon's gone and fucked something up. But more importantly, the very first thing the show does with the Cargills is a name switch up. Whatever it is, Sir Eric, you need to wait. I'm Eric, your grace. Really shows you that Condal deeply understands the source material and what truly matters to the story. Rhaenyra and Daemon go to the Valyria room, which I guess also has an annex where Viserys hangs out. It's mostly the model though, which is fucking enormous now and littered with cobwebs. This indicates that at some point Viserys let Helena and her spiders play with the city, father of the decade. Half of Rhaenyra's face is hidden when she greets her father, which is... I mean... You get it. Oh hey, it's Viserys. Glad to see he's still doing well. Probably just having a quick nap after running a marathon or inventing a new street toboggan event. Who goes there? Holy shit, he's incredible. 
This is tough for them. The spectre of the stranger looms so heavily that Damon can't even think about his brother as a person or interact with him as a loved one, so he just straightforwardly informs him of the political situation. I love that Rhaenyra is instantly like, what the fuck are you doing? Everyone's saying that Matt Smith looks exactly the same age while Rhaenyra and Alicent and Viserys have aged 20 years, but I don't know, he doesn't look the same as he did at the start. His wigs definitely got older. I think they pulled off aging pretty well for most characters, even people like Otto and Lyman, but there are a few that stick out like Harold Westerling, maybe Rhaenys, but especially Chum Bucket. Probably could have made him more youthful in the first half and older in the second half. As is, he basically just looks like a 20-something for the whole season. As a result, Viserys is understandably confused about the passage of time. We won that four years ago. I wonder if this is commentary on a senile old man being in charge of a country. Poor kids are just as bright and just as talented as white kids. The ultimate purpose of this series is and always has been, to subvert expectations. Which is that it was going to be entirely political. It was really about Trump. That's a bunch of malarkey! Perfect. Damon can't get through his sentences and I'm going to fucking cry. We tried, kids, was resurgent. There was a... There's a petition. Viserys' brain hurts, mood, and he's like, ugh, just let Otto do it. He knows what to do. His daughter's hot. But Damon says, nah, dude, you gotta do something. If you can't get down to the throne room yourself, we'll just weekend at Bernie's you. Rhaenyra interrupts the conversation when her dad asks what's happened to Corlys, either because she hasn't seen him in six years and doesn't want to talk business, or because she doesn't want her clearly perfectly fine father to hear that he's old friend is dying. Or because both. Or because neither. I could be an idiot. It's definitely possible. In any case, Vizzy meets baby Aegon and baby Vizzy. Oh my god, I love it. This would absolutely make his year. What man wouldn't want to meet the children his daughter had with his brother? The kids don't seem so excited, but I guess that's just because they're not so accustomed to meeting people who look like Halloween decorations. And this is Viserys. That, that is a name. Fit for a king. <laughs> He's a fucking comedic genius. Ow, my brain hurts. Can you hand me that heroin over there? Ooh, yeah, yeah. Bloody Balerian Rhaenyra, they've got him on the good shit. Okay, the maid scene. I was already having a good time, but this scene really dealed the seal for me. Aegon the rascal has gone and done a and so Alicent is presented with a young girl who her son is thoughtlessly doomed. Her life is now basically ruined just because Aegon was feeling that most heinous combination of horny and bored, and completely ignorant to how his actions impact others. I'm not sure if it's because he doesn't see women as people, or if he doesn't see the poor as people, or definitely both, but even when he's told the consequences, he doesn't really care? Understand? We'll get to him soon. Diana recounts what happened, and Alicent clearly has a tough time maintaining her composure. The hug she gives Diana might have been what Alice and herself thought she needed. All I wanted was for someone to say that they were sorry for what happened to me because what's happening here is that she's confronted with what amounts to her own story. As powerful as Alicent is, she too was coerced into sex with someone who outranked her socially. And just as Diana fears her reputation will be tarnished and her life ruined because of this, Alicent's personal relationship with the one person she actually liked was completely torn apart. Okay, it's not perfectly analogous, but you get the picture, there's the same elements. Sex, power, how these women both face consequences for the behaviour of someone else's penis, as above so below, ram a lam -a ding dong stare into the void long enough and it'll ask you to buy it dinner first. It's like when that guy in that movie meets that other guy and it's like, oh, I used to be like that, I guess. Tell me I wasn't this deluded. God of War is my favourite movie. Inside, boy. He called me boy. It's sort of like that thing Jorge said. It's like poetry, it's sort of if they rhyme. It's stylistically designed to be that way and you can't undo that but we can diminish the effects of it. Kristen Binks is the key to all of this. If we can get Kristen working, because he's a funnier character than we've ever had, Alicent is simultaneously sympathetic toward the sexually victimised young girl. She was her, after all. Well, of course. And she's now emblematic of the system that makes her life hell. She'll hug Diana in comfort, then threaten and bribe her to keep her silent, to safeguard her family's reputation. She'll tell Diana she believes her, then forces her to take a crazy potion that, from what we know, can do devastating things to your body. The same crazy potion that played a part in ruining the only halfway healthy relationship Alicent ever had. In this moment, Alicent is at once both the man and that girl. The oppressor and the oppressed. Perhaps I'm reading into this a bit too much. I'm not. But I just think it's neat that this conflict within Alicent is conveyed without so much as a word said about it. She has become the system she hates, and she knows it.
Hey, um, can you go destroy your body for me real quick? Thanks. Here's, like, fucking five bucks or whatever. I wonder if you can buy a horse with that. Oh, damn, she mad! How many times do I have to see this asshole's asshole? Aegon doesn't want to go to school today, but his mum's being a total... Itarian about it. Leave me alone, mum. It was... This is me checking my notes. I don't actually have any notes. This is a single blank piece of paper. Obviously all of my videos are entirely improvised, like a weird bird's mating dance or the Manhattan Project. Anyway, leave me alone, mum. It was... Just harmless fun! Just harmless fun! Aegon! No! Doing donuts in the office works car park at two in the morning is harmless fun. Putting googly eyes on your microphone so it feels like you're talking to a little guy when you're recording your videos is harmless fun. Burning down a journalist's house because he's getting too close to the truth is harmless fun. So there, criminals aren't witted. Fucking ripping someone is not harmless fun! Aegon! So they made Aegon more visibly the worst in the show. Is this Black's propaganda? I mean, probably not. The writer's main objective is making a good show, not whitewashing a fictional character most of the viewers have never heard of and demonizing another one. Like, obviously everyone's gonna have a different perspective on things, so the writers might think of certain characters more favorably than you might. And sure, you could call that a bias, but put your weird fetishization for a crazy incest freak aside and think about how this makes the story more complex. Alicent standing by Aegon is way more rife with emotion if she knows that he's a complete monster. It's the same with Rhaenyra finding out how Daemon's cruel and violent nature seems to know no bounds once he's pushed far enough. Aemon's ambitions are even more understandable if his brother is this much of a dropkick, and certain people supporting Rhaenyra over Aegon in the future could make more sense if it's known that he sucks. Remember that Otto pushed for Cerys to make Rhaenyra his heir over Daemon in the first place because he thought Daemon would be a dangerous king. How's that apply to Aegon? Alicent's tried nothing and she's all out of ideas, so she slaps her son and tells him he sucks. She's so good at parenting. I wonder if she blames herself for not raising him to respect Whammon. Not to absolve his father of blame here, all of his children with Alicent have issues that probably would have been mitigated if he'd paid them more mind. Aegon is a hedonistic slob. Helena is too perfect. Aemon is speaking Japanese all of a sudden for some reason. <laughs> And Daron is fucking invisible. Great job, Vizzy. I've done everything you've asked me to, and I try so. I try so hard, but it will never be enough for you or father. Mate, it actually takes less effort to not r people, but yeah. You are no son of mine. You are no son of mine. Of course, you can never excuse his behaviour, but you can think about what leads a dickhead down this path. Meanwhile, have you seen Diana? She's supposed to dress the children. Helena is perfect and I love her. She has no clue what's going on. Oh, you know what? Maybe she knows exactly what's going on. Damon and Rhaenyra discuss bringing their own doctor along to maybe treat Viserys a bit less shit, but Alicent walks in, busy day, and Rhaenyra hides the scar she gave her six years ago. The scar is a point of shame for Alicent and of vulnerability for Rhaenyra, and she doesn't want any of that surfacing here. It's been so long since we were granted the joy of your presence. Indeed. Yeah. Your grace. They're not long enough to merit a greeting upon our arrival. I'm so here for the polite shit talking. What can either of us know of ruling a kingdom? Game of Thrones was so much fun when political rivals veiled their insults in polite conversation. It's so good to see this stuff again. Damon questions how much of a say Viserys has in ruling the kingdom at this point. And how exactly is that wisdom expressed? Hmm? And blinks and wheezes. And Alicent's commitment to him. King Viserys' condition has worsened since you saw him last. <laughs> Liar! On the advice of the maesters. Oh, the maesters, of course. It is they who keep him addled on milk of the poppy. Oh no, she calls the maesters they! <laughs> Anyway, she accuses the High Towers of working with the Maesters to drug the king so they can control the realm. Alicent's like, no dude, your dad's like, dad. Damon says, I think you got those words wrong and also why did you replace all our cool dragon stuff with your lame religion? Is it for the obvious reason? Yes, it's for the obvious reason, of course it is. Also, I'm gonna be in charge of the thing tomorrow, but because I'm so nice and virtuous, I'll ignore what you just said. Damon, is this bitch trying to claim the moral high ground, the same one who cut my arm open the last time she saw me? Yep, same bitch. Hmm, interesting. 
interesting. Luke thinks the yard looks smaller, but Jace says it hasn't changed. That's because the six years since they were last year has been a larger portion of Luke's life than his brother's, and he's grown more comparatively. Cute little moment. Big Bro points out a hole in the brickwork where Luke went goblin mode, you know, like a moment that shows how strong he is. Then he's all anxious about some dudes looking at him. He knows why they left in the first place, and he knows he's here to stake a claim to a seat he's not actually related to. Unless you count Alyssa Valarian, which, pending other branches of the family not yet accounted for, Luke might actually be quite high in the line for Driftmark. Weird. Anyway, Jace is trying to- yeah. Seven hells, be careful with that thing! He tries to reassure his brother. It doesn't matter what they think. You are a Targaryen. But yeah, Jace, you try telling the people who think that, that what they think doesn't matter. Power resides where people believe it resides. Politics is all about what people think. Wait, that's what Alt Shift X said, but I have to be original. Um, politics has nothing to do with what people think. See, building on the works of Hegel, dialectical material- Oh, look at that! Combat! It's Crumpet vs. Aemond. Oh, I love him! Look at his chin! The lack of depth perception appears to have enhanced his swordplay. Very interesting. You win in Tawny's in no time. I don't give a shit about Tawny's. Holy fuck, this guy. I don't know about you because you never tell me anything, that's why I disappeared for a couple months, but this one line absolutely captivated me. He's just so relentlessly intense. There's an idea among fans that dragons and riders influence each other's personalities, and I'd say you can immediately see that Aemon has spent the last six years being influenced by an unstoppable killing machine. A sweet old iguana grandma who just wants to knit and burn the Dornish sands till they're glass. Watch out, Clumbo. Anyway, yeah, this guy is an absolute guy. Nephews? Have you come to train? Oh, he's a psycho! I love it! It's so unnerving that he noticed them, recognised them, and formulated the terrifying thing to say, all while trouncing a knight of the Kingsguard with one eye. Before any fun revenge can happen though, the Valarians arrive. Then there's a little scene with Otto and Alicent where Vaymond gets his head in the game and confirms that by not sticking to the status quo, they're all in this together. They're breaking free from Corlys' wishes. This alliance really could be the start of something new, what they've been looking for. They're gonna fucking bop to the top. There's like 10% of people who are losing their shit at that joke, and 90% who are like, just get back to the fucking screaming about dragons, mate. <laughs> Basically, they're brokering an alliance, yeah. Princess Rhaenys appears to be winning a staring contest against this tree, but she's interrupted by her beloved granddaughter Raina, who she's like super stoked to see. Rhaenyra awkwardly tags herself along, and Rhaenys is very aware that this is just a stunt from her to get her to please not disinherit my entire family. It might just work too, because Raina is cool. Or she might be if we knew anything about her. Of course, Rhaenyra is in rainy spad books for a bunch of reasons, but foremost is probably the whole sun killing thing. I think it's worth noting how insane it is that there are three characters in this scene and their names are Rainy, Rhaenyra, and Raina. I am so sorry to any normal people who happen to be watching this show. It must have been tough. Rhaenyra wonders what Rainy's motivation here is, but the video is getting too long, so I'll just blaze on ahead. Rhaenyra says, look, I didn't actually kill your son in Minecraft. It was just a prank anyway. Can we betroth my sons to your granddaughters now? So this is huge. It makes Baylor the future queen if Rhaenyra inherits, and Raina will rule Driftmark. Like, the only downside for Rhaenys is that she'd be tied to Rhaenyra's faction, a potentially sinking ship with whom she has some non-trivial issues. For Rhaenyra, well... A generous offer. Or a desperate one. Rhaenys is right. The hands of her two grown sons are Rhaenyra's most important political bargaining chips, and here she's offering both of them to one house which she's already kind of entangled with. She is desperate. If Luke can't secure the Driftmark inheritance, then both his and Jace's hands become practically worthless. It does not matter. Having lost her throne, both her children, and now potentially her husband, Rhaenys has now reached Pickle Rick levels of nihilism. Ultimately, Rhaenys foresees there's no way Rhaenyra can come out on top, even with her backing, so... They force you to your knees, and I must stand alone. Basically, they're brokering an alliance, except they don't, really. What, are you gonna cry over a little alliance? You're gonna cry? Mm, you cry, baby? Welp, things are looking pretty shit for Rhaenyra, so she goes to see her dad and his enormous nostrils. Unreasonable. She asks him about the prophecy and tells him he fucked up by making her heir because of, you know, the plot of this show. I thought I wanted it. I don't want it. I don't want it. My little child. 
Viserys, no! Good lord, they're both so good. So yeah, this was Rhaenyra's last chance to do something about this. If you wish me to bear it, then defend me. But it appears as though the king has just gone back to sleep instead of doing anything. Most relatable character, I swear to god. The next day, before Viserys has his morning opium, he tells Otto he wants to have supper. It is the morning, your grace. Uh, tonight. <laughs> So yeah, he wants to put on a big banquet because it'll probably be his last chance to see his entire family together and he might be able to forge an opportunity for peace. Even though his dealer insists, Viserys opts to not take his daily dose despite the obvious pain he's in, as he needs his wits about him today. In the throne room, at the thing, Otto Hightower sits the Iron Throne. This is a subtle nod to the hit television series Game of Thrones where characters would sometimes sit on the Iron Throne. Subscribe for more hidden easter eggs in House of the Dragon, and then unsubscribe so I don't have to eat a fucking book. I'm going to eat the Winds of Winter when it comes out. Are you going to read so, it before or after eating it? Why would I read it? While we all dearly hope that Corlys will survive his injuries, we've gathered here to squabble over his vast fortune. Vaymond is first to speak, and he begins with a history lesson about the Targaryens and Valarians. When the doom fell on Valeria, our houses became the last of their kind. Keltigar and Joy is absolutely molding right now. He speaks of the legacy of Valyria and how his family has to uphold it. Rhetoric which clearly targets Rhaenyra's kids. The true unimpeachable blood of House Valarian runs through my veins. Rhaenyra rudely interrupts him to lie about who upped her duff, and this is clearly against the rules, so Alicent shuts her butt down and puts her in time out. This is about the future and survival of my house, not yours. Luke, run! He's coming for you! So this is cool, because if Rhaenys accepted Rhaenyra's deal, then both houses would survive fine. Marriage solving succession crises, who would have thought? Luke, run! He's coming for you! Vaymond Shaw sure is talking a lot about the survival of his own line for someone who, as far as we know, has no children and no wife. This is a matter of blood, not ambition. This really is bullshit, because even if you discount Luke because he's a bastard and not actually a Valarian, leave him alone, he's never hurt anyone. <laughs> okay, well, he means well. Nobody questions Lena's children, so if you only cared about blood and not your own ambition, then surely Coley's own descendants come first before his brother. However, girls are icky, and allegedly they don't have balls, so I'm still not sure where their pee is stored, and I guess if you factor that in, then I guess Vaymond really should be Coley's legal heir. Rhaenyra Rhaenyra starts her spiel about how everyone said they would be nice to her 20 years ago, but then she gets upstaged by Viserys and Ramin Djawadi. You know, a lot of his compositions aren't all that complex, but the way he reworks these simple motifs into different places in the arrangement, that's what creates an emotional earworm in a score. The kind of thing that can absolutely carry a scene or even a whole show. The way Protector of the Realm tonally evolves to reflect the narrative progress and tension of the scene really showcases Jawadi's ability to weave music into the world. Like here. I will sit the throne today. Your Grace. <sighs> he sits on this A sus chord, simple yet tense, and when Otto concedes the throne and Viserys resumes his struggle towards it, the tension is released, the cadence is interrupted, the bass and melody move in contrary, opening up to this big beautiful B flat major chord before resolving to this tragic D minor we've been building to. But that gets immediately corrupted by some spooky extensions when Viserys dismisses the help of this Cargill, whoever he is. All this thoughtful matching of the visual and narrative experience to the score accomplishes so much for the audience. I reckon there's a decent argument to be made that Game of Thrones would never have become so astoundingly successful without this man's music. Oh, and by the way, this motif is a reworking of the King's Arrival. <laughs> it's the same you hear as the show's opening scene. I should stress that this isn't groundbreaking work, these techniques have been employed for centuries, but it is still great work. Of course, Jawadi isn't the only one blowing minds with his skill here. Paddy Considine. I can't imagine how much work goes into making this long hobble to the throne convincing, but he's done it. I completely forgot that he's just a cool dude in his 40s. I've been singing his praises since the very beginning, and it's great to be vindicated by the nigh-universal acclaim I've seen for his performance. Even George knows it. Viserys in the show is so much more compelling than the guy from the book. 
They're hardly even comparable. Anyway, back to dumb jokes. Damn, when was the last time he even sat the throne, you reckon? Could be years. Hightower's absolutely seething right now. No, we can't usurp his power while he's here. Bit of a Baldwin the fourth moment, hey? I love this long look at Rhaenyra. He's looking at all that's left of Emma and commits himself to defending her and her legacy. It's like he's conquering the throne, for the first time taking it by his own merit rather than having it given to him. But at the throne's swords, his crown falls from his head. He rejects assistance, but Damon picks it up for him and my heart breaks. With Damon's help, Viserys can take the throne as he always should have. Damon gives him his authority back and helps him overcome his personal weaknesses. We've come full circle. In episode one, Damon laments that he should have been Viserys' hand. 10 years you've been king and yet not once have you asked me to be your hand. And he talks about how House Targaryen needs to be strong and united, but Viserys keeps being driven from the brother he truly loves by interloping political forces. Here, now, the brothers work together. If only they were able to do that 30 years ago. You dropped this, king! So the big story is that this was improvised, the crown falling off his head and Damon picking it up. Apparently it happened during a rehearsal and everyone was like, oh wait, that's goddamn huge and it's gonna make Gligar fucking cry. So they kept it for the actual filming. Everyone expects Viserys to be completely incoherent, but no, he's just tired. And he completely fucks everyone's plans over. Like, I'm sorry, but Corlys was very clear about this. Why are we even here? And you can see how defeated Vaymond and Alicent immediately look. He asks for Rainey's take, saying that she's the only one who matters. Indeed, Your Grace. You know what? You're right. I am the only person who matters. Everyone watches on in fear as they wait to see what her position is. And it seems she's reassessed the situation, having seen her cousin, the King. Vaymond cannot believe Rainey's supporting Luke, but in her little speech, she mentions the betrothals Rhaenyra offered, so you can see what's really important to her here. Marry her sons, Jace and Luke, to Lord Corliss's granddaughters. Oh, Baylor doesn't mind that. Green's fuming right now, as Viserys confirms Luke's status as Corliss heir. And the next Lord of the Tides. Oh, he said it! Then, because he apparently doesn't care about living anymore, Vaymond challenges the king? You can't tell me who's heir to Driftmark because you broke the rules and made your heir a girl. I will not allow it. It's like you don't know what a king is, mate. That is no true Valarian. Vaymond is enraged that if the Valarian mantle should pass to Luke, his bloodline would not carry on, even though Rhaenys just said he would be marrying Rhaena. So tell us what you really think, Vaymo. Her children are bastards! Oh yeah, that's treason. But Viserys has never cared about treason, right? <sighs> Have your tongue for that. Again, Rhaenyra's honour is the only thing over which he's threatened someone with violent retribution. I told that idiot to slice my sandwich! Ow! He can keep his tongue. Ah! so cool! Otto is all screamy for some reason, but Damon's like, nah, I'm, I'm done, we're all good. Thanks for giving me enough time for my epic one-liner, though. Eamon is fanboying! <laughs> And you can see Helena cover her ears, which is such beautiful little detail. Like it really seems that they put the work in to actually portray what it means for someone to be autistic. So whether it was Fear or the writers or someone else who thought of that, good job. Viserys collapses because epic scenes are a lot of work and he says, I must. Now that Rhaenyra is back in King's Landing, Viserys sees he has to fix this mess, and also because he wasn't drugged today. Rhaenys watches her brother-in-law get embalmed. Wow, do you think they're proud of their prosthetics or what? Orwell's like, um, it's pretty weird that you're just staying here, you can leave. But Rhaenys has no fear of death, she says, and wants to hang out with the stranger. It is ill luck to look upon the face of death. I assure you. It cares little whether my eyes are open or closed. Jesus, fuck, she's cool. At the Last Supper, by the way, this show has a lot of shots that are directly inspired by historical artwork, like The King's Daughter by Edouard Feit, Le Heron Familiaire by Capo Bianchi, of course, Da Vinci's Last Supper, and DreamWorks Animation's seminal masterpiece, Mmm, Shrek. You know how everyone loses their minds over, like, that one shot in season eight? That one shot in season six? Well, every episode of House of the Dragon has a few shots that take my breath away. This show is gorgeous. 
Viserys gets carried in the way he fucking deserves and he's got an epic dragon head cane and he's living his best life. And he do got that drip though. How good it is to see you all tonight. How does he do this with his voice? Alicent leads an awkward family prayer. You can see Rhaenyra's family is like, huh? Who is this crazy woman talking to? Whereas Alicent's family is doing the whole religion thing. She prays for a happy and prosperous union and that Vaymond has a good time being dead, to which Damon's response is, oh yeah, I killed him earlier today. I'm so cool. The betrothed cousins seem pretty happy, which is a sentence I hate. Well done, Jace. You'll finally get to lie with a woman. Ooh, Aegon's a c just to everyone, isn't he? Come on, Eggsy, don't you remember how you used to tease Eamon together? Jace wears that one, because, I mean, aren't you supposed to not fuck out of wedlock? What's the bet that the audition to play Eamon was just staring at people and they had one look at Mitchell and thought, oh, fuck him, that's the guy, hire him! Did you know how the act is done, I assume? Okay, well, at least he's funny. You can play the gesture if you wish. Hold your tongue before my betrothed. He's cool with being insulted himself, but if you besmirch his new girlfriend, he'll go bastard mode on you. Kind of reminds me of someone. Keep my wife's name out your fucking mouth! Viserys goes mask off, revealing that he was actually King Viserys all along. He laments how distant his family has become and comes to them as, well... Not just a king, but your father, your brother. Your husband and your grandsire. He for sure thinks he's gonna die real soon, so this is his last attempt to do something. Basically, he invokes his own death to bring his family back together. It really is his last moment of strength, and it seems to work. How could it not? My own face is no longer a handsome one, if indeed it ever was. Does this man ever turn it off? If not for the sake of the crown, and for the sake of this old man, who loves you all so dearly. Oh my god, he's killing me. Rhaenyra and Alicent deliver impromptu speeches about how they do not hate each other's dumb, stupid faces, how their shared commitment to Viserys unites them, and of course, how they have both definitely written fanfiction about each other. We have more in common than we sometimes allow. Oh no, you can see genuine connection, fuck me. And we love our children. Mm, okay, sure mate. At the end of it, Alicent says, You will make a fine queen. Dude, what the fuck? So you can see this is her conceding the battle because Rhaenyra clearly won today, but you could also just see it as Viserys' motion for peace actually working. What Aegon do? Oh, he solicits Baylor. Soliciting your cousin? Cringe. Obviously it's just to get a rise out of Jace, but it's indicative of what's at play here. The tentative peace forged by the mothers is swiftly undone by the enmity they've bred into their sons, just as Otto sculpted Alice and herself to be paranoid of Rhaenyra and her family. Jay stands up annoyedly, and then Aemon stands up threateningly. Oi, Quill. Omae wa ore sama ga dore kurai nagaku mabataki o sezu ni irareru ka. Jace backs down and speaks of fond memories of our shared youth and the peace they may exercise in the future. <laughs> the punch on the shoulder. You are the beast beneath the lords. Sorry, what was that, Helena? You are the beast beneath the lords. Oh fuck, that's ominous. I think foremost of the many things Helena could mean by this is the danger lurking under the surface of this gathering. Everyone's talking about moving forward and working together, but there's a generation of hostility they're trying to cover up, and the literal beast they're about to bring up. She also means the thing that happens next time on House of the Dragon. Melees, no! And the other thing that I have to pretend I don't know about. Helena gives a fucking hilarious toast about marriage. It isn't so bad, mostly he just ignores you. Except sometimes when he's drunk. But Helena, that's always. <laughs> Looks like she's had a few herself. Yes, great job, Helena. Wonderful speech. Play the tunes! Let us have some music. Jace asks to dance with Helena, which might be the only fun she's had with a man in years. They dance awkwardly and enthusiastically and- Alison, we could have had this! You took this away from us! You- So this piece is just beautiful. Weirdly, it's one of the very few bits of score that didn't make its way onto the currently released soundtrack. This song could be the original Dance of the Dragons. Yeah, the name is a reference to a cycle of ballads about two lovers in the Doom of Valyria. And they haven't released it yet because this tune is going to be the actual 
actual opening theme of the show. Now that's some cope, but I am here to huff it. I feel like all my kids grew up and then they married each other. Oh look, there's actual joy happening. What the fuck? This isn't my dragon show. We're not here to talk about the bad dragon show. We're here to talk about the good dragon show because Hang despite- I, I cannot let you say the words bad dragon and just let that <laughs> slide. This must be slaying Viserys. He's so taken by the peace. Some people think that this is so unreasonably cheery that it couldn't possibly be real and that Viserys is just hallucinating and that's what we're seeing. Otto being happy? Yeah. Nah, I think the peace, the happiness, the joy, it's all real, which just makes it all the more heartbreaking. Ah, finally, I have joined my family together. I can fucking die now. Dude, he must fucking stink. Everyone stands as the king is escorted and his replacement is brought in. They killed the pink dread, no! Oh, uh, this isn't gonna go well. Luke has a bit of a giggle, then... <laughs> Final tribute. I guess he's had enough of this whole pretending to get along business. Each of them handsome, wise. Okay, he's my favorite psychopath. Strong. So yeah, even though- Come. Excuse me. Come. Even though your mum and my mum say we should get along all of a sudden, let's beat the shit out of each other. The conflict has evolved past the princess and the queen at this point. This man has the most villainous chin I've ever seen. Daddy Damon steps in to break it all up. Mmm. You're just a cheap fucking knockoff. Oh no, no, no. I'm the upgrade. One last attempt at fixing this personally. Let me see the children home. Harlem. Um... Return on Dragonback. Uh-huh, sure you will, Nero. Oh my god, Alicent, we're in public. At a big house somewhere in the city, Lady Missaria awaits a visitor. She seems to have become a very successful Varys in her time here. A spy swings by to talk to her. It's been quite a night at the castle, Sims. I'm fucking sorry? What? Way step forward and tell me of your way. Alison gives Viserys some dope for his pain and wipes around his little face hole, his side mouth. He's completely out of it and thinks he's talking to Rhaenyra, who the previous night asked him if he really believed in that one dream about the world ending and her being the prophesied saviour or whatever. Alison has never heard a peep of this, so she has no idea what's going on. Suddenly, Viserys, who appears to be losing his grip on the mortal coil, is talking about some prophecy and a prince and Aegon. Aegon. His dream. The prince that was promised. And he's using some pretty intense language. To unite the realm against the cold and the dark. And he's urging her to do something about it. You are the one. You must do this. Now, Viserys has never given Aegon the time of day, and Alicent knows this, but if you pair this with the dream he told her all those years ago of- A male babe, born to me, wearing the Conqueror's crown. I never imagined I would remarry. Then I would have a son. Aegon, the prince that was promised. Of course she's going to interpret this as a deathbed confession that he should have made Aegon his heir all those years ago. Yes. What else could she possibly interpret this as? I understand my king. Meanwhile, Viserys thinks that he's reaffirming to his chosen heir, Rhaenyra, that she truly is the destined saviour of mankind. He dies thinking that he has fixed everything, that in his final day of life he set the world up to continue well without him. No more, he says. No more pain, no more suffering, no more conflict within his house. And then he lets past his lips what has been at the forefront of his mind for 20 years. Oh, no more. Oh, my love. No more, my love. No more of this terrible life without you. Well, now that's done, I can finally enjoy my potato chips. Paddy Considine has upstaged everyone. Award shows are a joke, obviously, and I don't care what happens at them, but I will permanently close the chakras of everyone involved if he doesn't win every Emmy. Even the one for Outstanding Variety Talk Series. Oh my god, I would watch the fuck out of that. Years from now, we will still be raving about this performance. So yeah, Game of Thrones isn't just good again. It's outstanding again. Can't wait to see how the next episode follows it up. Next time on House of the Dragon. 
the king is totally dead. Can the queen get a hold of the prince before her father reaches him? Will anybody understand what this chick is saying? And what's this guy's deal with feet? Find out on the next exciting episode of House of the Dragon. Subscribe to Glidus. <laughs> Ha 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 